Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, do want to do a quick uh, Bible reading. Um, God pointed out some things to me, so if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we did some studies in the past, uh, ordinances and um, Colossians chapter 2. And we did some studies in the past talking about liberty. And God, when I was doing this study, uh, my private study, my Bible reading, Got a plane coming. It's one of the National Guard helicopters. I got a call this morning and woke up about possible tsunamis uh, coming in on the uh, west coast along California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska. So, I woke up early this morning. <laughs> so, please pray for me. Um, I'm, I know God knows what he's doing, but what the Bible say about earthquakes in diverse places? Yeah. But I wanted to point out some things that God showed me in my daily reading with you brothers and sisters again for a stand and talk. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some other epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? What do we get from this? Brother and sister Christ, how many of you like this? How many of you guys want this? You like to be patted on the back. How many men in ministry, I'm just going to tell you right now, we're going to get into this in another study, but one of the things Satan loves to do is when he starts to see a man in ministry start to get a little, just a little prideful, he goes after that pride with a huge pump and starts pumping it up. And how does he do it? He does, he does it through the brethren. He does it through what I call snakes that sneak into the body of Christ in the comment section. Oh, you're so great. Oh, you're so awesome. And they start puff, puffing him up. They don't give God the glory. They're giving all the glory to that man. And they puff that pride up to the pride. All of a sudden you start seeing ego along with the pride. Okay? Be very careful. I've seen brethren that were very uh, humble at one time, giving God the glory in all things. And now they take all the glory for themselves. Okay, have you ever heard that before? I was the first one to do this, and I was the first one to do that, and I did this, and I did that, and I sacrificed my day to be with you, and I did this. What is that? You're getting puffed up. And there's, like I said, I believe some brethren are getting caught up in this also that are saved. They're getting caught up of not giving God glory in all things. Paul's saying we don't need commendation letters from you. Okay, we don't need you patting us on the back and trying to elevate us. Paul already talked about in another scripture. Was Paul cross, crucified for you? And we're going to get further in this verse. Okay, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And you get this this uh, respecter of persons, and you get these people, and they're worshiping the man Paul. He's saying we don't need that. Verse two: Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Right here, we're reading it in our hearts. It always goes back to a heart issue. Okay, is your heart right with the Lord? And one of the things is, is you got to give God glory in all things. I heard a brother in Christ once do a teaching on how being married made him a better preacher, and having children made him a better preacher. So he was taking the glory from God and giving it to his wife, he was taking glory from God and giving it to his children. Yet the greatest preacher that ever lived outside of Jesus for the church age is Paul. And Paul was not married. Yet he tells you on how to be married. Paul was not, did not have children of his own. Yet he tells you how to be a good father and a good mother. Raise your children in the admonition of the Lord. Okay? Why? What made Paul a great preacher? God did. You know what makes you brothers in Christ that stand up and say, hey, I want to be a preacher and I want to preach the word of God and I want to be in ministry? You know what makes you a great preacher? God does through his perfect written word by the Holy Spirit. Give God all the glory, not just some of the glory, all the glory. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Ye are our epistles written in our hearts. We preach the plan of salvation to you out of love from our hearts. No hidden agenda. We're not because we're puffed up or we think that we are some great one. No. Okay. Verse 3. For as much as ye are manifest, declare, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. 
manifestly physical fruits. The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. It's not just in word, but it's also in deed. Okay, declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the capital S spirit. Because in that day they were using ink and paper. Uh, I see, not written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. We're going to get into this. The next part says, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. When we were talking in our Colossians 2 study, Brother Says Christ, we are talking about how, what is Paul fighting the most? He's trying to lead people to Christ. He's witnessing to the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews predominantly reject Jesus Christ, but there's still some Jews that get saved. There's some false Jews, fake Jews. That the real Jews, but they're fake Christians that are Jews that believe but are zealous for the law. What's the number one people he's fighting all throughout the whole Pauline epistles? The Jews. They're coming in, tables of stone. What was the Ten Commandments written off of? Stones, tables of stones. You had to keep the Ten Commandments to please God and to be saved. To show, and what is the laws? The laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And we're going to keep going here. But what he's saying is, is that it's not because of your good works and that you're, you're keeping the law and you're circumcised and you're keeping the laws of Moses. That's not why you're saved. That's not why you're saved. Because if that's why you're saved, the cross of Christ is of none effect. What Jesus did, it didn't matter. If you, could, if you could be saved by keeping the law, the letter of the law, that's what it's talking about, ink, or the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. Verse 4, and, so, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Okay, we need to make sure that we're trusting God, not ourselves. Right? Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. See, don't trust ourselves. We trust God. It's, we're no great one. To God be the glory. To think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. It is God that gets the glory. It is God that, Paul's saying, it's God that showed me the gospel to share with you. To show you how to get saved. It's no longer the Levitical laws. In the Old Testament, you had to keep the Levitical laws in order to be saved. The laws of Moses. But today, today, that's not true. The laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When it, means, when it says bring us to Christ, it's not talking about Jesus as far as, as he is today. It's talking about the cross. To bring you to the Jesus that died on the cross. He's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. That's what it means. In Colossians 2 we talked about this. What was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2? The laws of Moses. Holy day, Sabbath day, new moon, the ordinances within the laws that you had to keep in order to be saved in the Old Testament. Okay. Nothing that we do can save us. And Paul's no saying, I'm no great one that I have the I can give you salvation and grant you salvation. No, I'm just a minister. I told you about salvation, where to find salvation. Where's that at? In Jesus Christ. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of our own selves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Remember, Paul's always fighting the Jews because they're still trying to keep the Old Testament going, the Old Testament going. You have to keep the Levitical laws. You have to do animal sacrifices. When Jesus died on the cross and said, It is finished, the Jews don't believe that. Most Jews back then, in Paul's day, that were getting saved, didn't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So they were false converts. They came in and they believed, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, they believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But guess what? So did the Catholics. So did the Mormons. So did Jehovah's Witnesses. So did all these denominations, Protestant, um, Presbyterian, um, all this stuff, Baptist, all that stuff. They all believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what's the problem? They don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They don't believe in it for one second. And that's the whole point. 
That's why he has to make a point to say New Testament versus the Old Testament. People are still trying to go to the old ways in order to be saved. They don't want to go through Jesus Christ fully and completely. Just like today, we have people who don't want to repent and believe in the finished work. You can't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross if you don't repent. You can't. I got another study we're going to be doing. I'm really going into this, but the easy believism, they believe it isn't finished. They need to sin that grace may abound. He needs to be whipped a few more times. I can live however I want and sin however I want, and I need to keep sinning so God's grace will abound. There's no changed life. That's the easy believism. I can live however I want and do whatever I want. I got a free pass to heaven. Boy, are they in for a rude awakening. If the catch and way happens, and they get left behind. If they don't truly repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Remember, the laws are our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They're to let us know that we're dead in trespasses and sins. We've sinned against an, all, an almighty righteous God that's going to judge us one day. We can't keep the Levitical laws. We can't keep the law. They call it the laws of Moses, but they're the laws of God. That's why it says the laws of God are written on every man's heart. But the Jews, they worship men. They like to worship men other than God, other than Jesus Christ. That's why they call it the laws of Moses. Okay, We call it the laws of Moses because God gave it the, his law through Moses. But they say it as if Moses is some kind of God, as we're going to keep reading here. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law of sin and death was nailed at the cross. You want to be freed from the, you want to have liberty from the law of sin and death? You need to go through Jesus Christ on the cross. If you don't, then you have to go through the laws, the Levitical laws, to get out of the law of sin and death. And there's not one person except for Jesus Christ, the person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, that ever, ever was perfect and was able to keep all the laws. He's the only one. Verse 7, but if, by, but if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfast behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which, which glory was to be done away. The glory was to be done away. Jesus, who is God, and he was there in the Old Testament, okay, in the beginning was the capital W word, and the word was with God capital G God, and the capital W word was the capital G God, was God. Jesus was there at the very beginning. He had a plan. The moment Adam and Eve failed, he had a plan. God had a plan the whole time. Okay, The laws are there to lead us to Christ. Verse 8, How shall not the, the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? They thought the, the laws were something great, and they looked at Moses, and Moses was glowing because he had seen the backside of God, and he had been with God. How much glorious is today, brother and Christ? We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have fellowship with God every day. He's with us every day. We also have that blessed hope. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. If you think that the, the laws are anything great, how much greater is the law of God? You have the law of sin and death. You have the Levitical laws that, that lead you to the law of sin and death and realize, help you realize that you're filthy, you're wicked, you're no good, you're going to hell and you deserve to go to hell because you broke the laws. You're under the law of sin and death. And for some reason, for the Jewish people, this is a glorious thing. This is a glorious thing. And today you have the Catholic Church that counterfeits the Jewish people. They're a counterfeit of the chosen people. We are adopted into the Jewish people. The Catholic Church and the daughters, all those denominations I mentioned that believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, but they don't believe in the finished work, the daughters of the whore. Okay. Once again, they believe that their papal traditions and their laws, they make up their own laws, are more important. They're so glorious. We're just so glorious. How much more glorious is what Jesus did for us on the cross? True biblical salvation. Living a life of Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. 
someday to be caught up in glory like Jesus was. That's way more glorious. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. What's he saying here? Uh, hello, the, the laws that you hold in such glory are schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The point is to Jesus Christ. What's going on? You have Jews coming in to the Gentiles here telling them that they have to keep the laws and the laws are so glorious and everything. Uh, what, uh, was it Peter, I think it was, told Jesus, look at this temple and how glorious it is, the physical temple. How glorious that physical temple is. How much more glorious is this temple for the Holy Spirit? You, brothers and sisters Christ, the glory that's in you, not that that glory is my glory, it's God's glory that's in me, the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's talking about here. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, such hope, we saved have such hope, that blessed hope. We use great plainness of speech. You know the number one people that argue over words, when the Bible talks about people who like to argue over words, are the people that like to add to this book. They can't handle the words that God chose. So they have to add their own words. There's a, I told you, Brother Jesus Christ, words have meaning. One of the things about this ministry is words have meaning. Absolutely. Okay? So there's a difference between sitting there saying, I'm going to tell you the definition of this word, and I'm going to give you an example of this word in action. But you never change the word that God chose. You have brethren that are changing the word of God and turning it into a lie so they can have their sin. And you know who you are. Okay. We use great plainness of speech. The simple words of God. The Bible talks about through good words and fair speeches. Good words, plural, and fair speeches. Deceiving the hearts of the simple. Well, you know, it's this word here, but, but we can use this word over here, and, and we can change this word. We're not really changing this word. That word is still there. I'm not denying that that word's there, but I prefer to use this other word instead in place of that word. Yeah. Using good words and fair speeches. Deceiving the hearts of the simple. And I told you, Brother Says Christ, the more you get into this book, and the more you hide this book in your heart, the less simple you'll be. The harder it is for for wolves in sheep's clothing, brethren that have fallen away, to come in and deceive you. Okay? Seeing then that we have such hope, and like I said, I still have brethren fight me on the Blessed Hope study that we did, putting on a helmet for a hope of righteousness. I'm sorry, the wrong thing, that's the breastplate of the righteous. Helmet for a hope of salvation. And what salvation is it? A hope of salvation. The Blessed Hope. And you got people still fighting me on that. They can't handle what the scriptures plainly teach. The scriptures plainly teach. It says, in this present time, when Paul was preaching in his time, in this present time, looking for that blessed hope. And it's talking about the life you're living. They were looking for Jesus to come back any day in Paul's time. Did he come back? No. And the next generation? No. But every generation of Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women were looking for that blessed hope. That's what got them through each day. That's what gets me through each day. And you've got brethren coming by with uh, great, uh, good words and fair speeches trying to get you to take off your helmet for a hope of salvation. Be very careful, brother, says Christ. If they're not using plainness of speech, be very careful. If they're changing the words of God because they don't like the way God said it, so they say it in their own way, those are people you probably need to stay away from. Okay. Like I said, be careful when you see people. There's a difference between someone taking the word, giving you the definition, and giving you example. There's nothing wrong with them comparing scripture with scripture. I know that's very outdated today, 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing. That's just really out there for brethren to actually rightly divide and compare scripture with scripture today. It's all about feelings and opinions. Sorry, going off of that little tangent a little bit. But remember what's going on here. Moses. It's talking about Moses, the Levitical laws, the Jews holding the Levitical laws above what Jesus did. They believe, but they don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It isn't finished because you still have to keep the law also in order to be saved. It isn't finished because you still can sin all you want and just sin, 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 and keep, you know, you're supposed to sin that grace may abound. 
But Paul already corrected that and said, are we to sin? We, who are truly saved and born again, who went through repentance towards God and faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save us. We, who are truly saved again, are we supposed to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But you have the easy believism that teaches the opposite. Oh, no, you can sin all you want. We need to keep sinning because we need that grace to really abound. They don't believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They don't. Because if they did, their attitude towards sin would, would be, I hate sin. I don't want to sin anymore. Lord, I belong to you. You're my capital K king. You're my Lord. You command. I obey. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Amen. I had a brother fighting me on video games still. I still, every once in a while, I get people getting on my video, what I, the video I did about still playing video games. And they say, well, well, I agree that some are wicked, but some are okay. And they're, they're addicted to video games. I understand the addiction. I was addicted to video games. I know a lot of you brothers and sisters of Christ out there were addicted to video games. It's very addicting. What are they doing? They're justifying the flesh. They need to check themselves. Verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfast look to the end that which is abolished. You no longer go through the laws. That's the part that's abolished. The laws are still there because we're still under the law of sin. But the law of sin and death, when you get saved, death gets dropped. You're no longer under the law of sin and death. But what he's talking about, the abolished part here, is not that it's okay to fornicate now. It's okay to get drunk now. It's okay. No, no. What he's saying here is, in the Old Testament, you had to go through the Levitical laws in order to be saved. And then in the Levitical laws, there was animal sacrifices. When you failed God and you failed the Levitical laws, there was times where you could do animal sacrifices to cover those sins. Some sins you couldn't cover. No animal sacrifice was going to cover it. You sinned certain sins, you lost your salvation in the Old Testament. But there were some sins that you could do animal sacrifices and it would cover your sins. But this says, steadfast look to the end of that which is abolished. Going through the Levitical laws, the laws of Moses, in order to be saved was done away with today. It's going to come back in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. But today it's been done away with when Paul's writing this to the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, the Levitical laws. Which veil is done away in Christ. It's done away. You go through Jesus Christ now to get saved. You don't go through the Levitical laws to get saved. You see what's going on here, brothers and sisters of Christ. Remember what the Bible says, that Jesus is a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? Because, not necessarily because they require a sign, because they do. They require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But what it is, when it talks about the stumbling block, it has to do with the, the Jews are saying, we have to have some laws. i got to do something to be saved. I have to do some physical work. Where's the animal sacrifices? I've got to make a sacrifice in order to be saved. I can't, they just can't wrap their head around the fact that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. When he said it is finished, it is finished. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. So when they came in and said, hey, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, they're zealous. They're zealous of the law. They still kept trying to bring in the law in order to be saved. They weren't truly, they weren't truly born again. They didn't believe, they didn't repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? The veil is done away in Christ. If you don't go through Jesus Christ, you're going to have to go through the Levitical laws. But regardless whether you go through the Levitical laws or you go through Jesus Christ, Jesus is the one that's going to be judging everybody. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone. Either at the great white throne or at the judgment seat of Christ. When the law of sin and death was nailed to the cross, it's twofold. You go through Jesus Christ to get saved, or you're going to be judged hardcore by Jesus Christ at the great white throne. You still have to go through Jesus Christ. Are you going to go through Jesus Christ for salvation? Or are you going to go through Jesus Christ to be judged? and tossed into the lake of fire, and then, you know, to burn for all eternity. Done away with in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. 
And today it's not just the Jews, but back then, remember, there is no Catholicism back when Paul was writing this. There was the Mystery Babylon. I'm sorry, there was Catholic, there was Mystery Babylon, but I'm talking about the Catholic Church that we know today. It wasn't there back then. Catholic, uh, Catholic, uh, Mystery Babylon, if you read the book, uh, there's a great some books out there that talk about how Mystery Babylon went and became part of the Egyptian false god religion, then became Rome's false god religion, and now it's how we have the Catholic Church today, and it's bounced from place. So was it back there? Yes. But Paul wasn't fighting that hardcore. What Paul was fighting was the Jews wanting to bring the law in. But even to this day, many Moses read, Moses, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. You tell them about Jesus Christ, whether they believe or not believe, they still think they have to keep the Old Testament laws in order to be saved. Today you have the counterfeit Catholic Church out there doing the same thing that the, that the Jews were doing back here to the Gentiles. Oh, no, 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 you've got to keep these laws. You've got to do the Eucharist. We have our own sacrifice. It's called the Eucharist. And you've got to keep that sacrifice in order to be saved. And you've got to go to Babel buildings in order to be saved. And you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. And you've got... They're counterfeit. But back then, Paul was dealing with the Jewish people. That's why the big... I, I don't understand why there's such a big... Uh, how do you say it? argument, disagreement over Romans 14, 5, 6, and 7 or Colossians chapter 2 why is there such a huge disagreement? because brethren aren't comparing scripture with scripture but unto this day when Moses has read the veil is upon their hearts nevertheless when it shall turn to the Lord the veil shall be taken away Mainly talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God's going to turn back to the Jewish people. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. God has put Israel to the side to deal with the Gentiles. And I pray Jews get saved today and that they don't have to go into that time of Jacob's trouble. You don't want to go into that time of Jacob's trouble. But Jew as a nation, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, they still are, as a nation, have been put off. It's been put to the side. And God will come back to it. And that veil will be taken away in the time of Jacob's trouble. You'll have Moses and Elijah preaching Jesus Christ to him, going through the Old Testament all the way to the New. You remember the passage? I don't know if you remember, because I don't remember the exact spot, but the passage where Paul's doing the same thing to the Jewish people. Why was he preaching Jesus all day? Does it take all day to preach Jesus Christ? No, not to me. Not to you, brother, says Christ, if you're a Gentile. But why did it take all day for Paul to preach Jesus to the Jewish people? Because he had to go through all the laws, all the Levitical laws, the Old Testament. Okay, this is the type of Christ. This is the type of Christ. This He's leading this. Who is he talking about here? He's talking about God's going to come in the likeness of sinful flesh to pay for the sins of the world. And he had to go through the whole books of Moses and, and the Levitical laws and everything to point him to Jesus Christ. And that took all day. And they still rejected. But in the time in the time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have Moses and Elijah come back and do the same thing Paul was trying to do. Only Moses and Elijah is going to have uh, signs and wonders. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. They're going to have signs and wonders. And at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take that veil away completely. No more questions. No more doubting. No more denying the truth. Because the truth is man that's manifest is going to be standing right before them. But what about us, brothers and sisters Christ? Now the Lord is that Spirit, capital S Spirit. And where the capital S Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. I've had so many people misuse this verse to justify sin. Video games. I got attacked recently. Video games. And someone said, we have liberty. We have liberty. And we've already talked about this, brother. I'm not going to go into it hardcore, but you're liberated from the law of sin and death. When it talks about liberty here, what did we just talk about? The laws, the Levitical laws, the consequences from the Levitical laws. If you sin against God, you go to hell. That's what the law is. But you, if you have the, it says, now the Lord is that capital S spirit. And where the capital S spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Today, when I fail the Lord, and it happens sometimes when I fail the Lord, whether in thought, word, or deed, I don't go to hell and burn for all eternity. I don't lose my salvation. Why? Because I have liberty. That's why Paul said, do not use liberty as an occasion for the flesh. I have liberty, so I can sin all I want, right? 
No. But we've been liberated from the law of sin and death. We no longer have to go through the Levitical laws in order to be saved. My soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. I'm part of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. My soul is not connected to this wicked, vile flesh here that you see before you. My soul is connected to Jesus' body. That's why I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My soul can be in two places at once. It's here, because it has to be here, but it's also, since it's connected to Jesus, who is now my body, it's in heaven also. But we see here that liberty when it applies to a Christian today, is always saying you've been liberated from the Levitical laws, the consequences of the Levitical laws that lead you to the law of sin and death, and ultimately you've been freed from the law of sin and death. You're still in the law of sin. We still have to answer for our sins at the judgment seat of Christ. We just talked about that. Everybody has to answer to Jesus Christ. We ultimately answer for our sins when we go to the cross. You reject the cross, you're going to answer for all your sins at the great white throne. And you're going to, have to, and you're going to be held accountable to the Levitical laws. The laws of God that they call the laws of Moses. That's the laws of God. That's what you're going to be held accountable to. But if you go to the cross, repent, fall down on your knees in repentance, godly sorrow for sinning against him, your personal sins that you've sinned against him, it's because of your personal sins that Jesus is on the nail to that cross. And he said, it is finished, it is finished. You have now been liberated from the law of sin and death. That's what the liberty is talking about here. How can anybody get this liberty out to be anything else? Well, Ultimately, when you see someone make a mess of liberty, every time in my, and I've only been saved for seven years, but in my life as a Christian, anytime I see someone make a mess of liberty, it's because they have sin in their life that they're trying to hide under liberty. And I'm not talking about, remember we said, liberty, if you sin, you don't go to hell. What I mean by hiding it under liberty is they're trying to turn liberty into something where it has something to do with non-sin. It's something that's not sinful and wicked, and we have liberty and we can do it. So they're justifying sin. They're not saying, hey, it's sin. I failed the Lord. Lord, forgive me. They repent, forsake, get back to the Lord. They're not going to hell. What they're doing with that liberty is they're saying that this thing that the Bible calls sin, idolatry, covetousness, addictions like video games, like holidays, okay? There are people are taking that and saying, well, the Bible says we have liberty, therefore it's saying that it's okay to sin now. And then they, after a while they start changing it and saying, well, that makes us still look bad when we say it's okay to sin. We won't go to hell when we sin because that's what the Bible teaches. We're going to take the word sin away completely and say now it's just choose, choice. That's all liberty is. we got the right to choose, to choose, to choose, to choose. We can choose this. It's not sin anymore. We can choose. See how that works? Perversion, nature of perversion. It gets worse and worse and worse. But we just read there, brothers and sisters Christ, how the laws of Moses, how the veil was on their face, and how the Jews still think that they have to keep the laws in order to be saved. And it just talks about how with the Lord, now the Lord is that capital S spirit. It's also the Godhead. G There's only one capital L, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is that capital S Spirit, which is always the Holy Spirit, whether it's a lowercase s referring to the Holy Spirit or a capital S referring to the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, you get truly saved and born again. The Holy Spirit comes in. The Bible says what He hears, therefore that's what He speaks. God the Father speaks through the Holy Spirit to us. There is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding and as beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Why? It doesn't say glass darkly. There's another spot that talks about a glass darkly. But this just says in a glass of the Lord. Are changing into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. I, don't, I, can just fa I can just daydream about what it's like to have an incorruptible body that never gets tired, never gets hungry, never gets thirsty, never, you know, the sin, it's not in charge, it's not tempting me, it's not trying to pull me away from the Lord and mess up my walk with the Lord. I can daydream about it, 
and we're told about it. That's why it talks about a glass. We're looking through a glass, so it's not 100% clear, but it's pretty clear. The Bible tells us. Heaven, what's heaven going to be like? God t tells us that there's going to be a catching away of the body of Christ someday, and it's going to be glorious. That there's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, he shows us things. He shows us that salvation, how we're two-thirds redeemed today. This body right here is not redeemed. We can understand and see things, but we won't see everything. But we can see a lot, because if you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes in, He'll bring you into all truth. Now, it doesn't say all truth in one second. That's not what it says. It says He'll bring you into all truth. And your life as a Christian, through the Holy Spirit and through His Word, God will start bringing you into all truth. As things come into your life, God will show you the truth. Something else comes into your life, God will show you the truth. It's all timed out. Okay? But remember, brothers and sisters of Christ, when God put this in my heart, I just wanted to do a quick reading with you once again that if you were able to follow along the Colossians 2 study for ordinances in Colossians 2, the long road, I know it was a long study, but the whole point, I could have used these verses, and I didn't. Sometimes there's so many verses, we don't use them all. But two things to walk away from this talk, brothers and sisters of Christ, is the understanding that the Levitical laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And that's what it's talking about in Romans 14, 5, 6, and 7. That's what it's talking about in Colossians 2, the Levitical laws. Okay? And that the Jews hold on to it and desperately need it. And today you've got Roman Catholicism out there really pushing that they're acting, the, they're the new Jews, they're the new Jews. And you're supposed to go through them and they have the same attitude. They have their laws, you have the laws of God, and then you've got Satan has his laws, which is based off of rudiments of the world and traditions of men and oftentimes they're contrary and offensive to the laws of God because they're a sick, twisted counterfeit. But remember, Paul was dealing with the Jews back then, coming in among the Gentiles and telling the Gentiles that they had to be saved. They had they're trying to get the Gentiles to act like them, having that veil over their face. Every time the Old Testament's read, they have a veil over their face. They can't seem to see Jesus Christ fulfilling the Old Testament. That They can't see the laws of God, what they call the laws of Moses, that lead you to the law of sin and death. They can't see that nailed to the cross. They can't understand when Jesus says, it is finished, it is finished. And like I said, today people are... I, I got accused of lying against liberty when... The ones that usually jump up and down and say, you're lying against liberty, you're lying against it. They're the ones making a mess of liberty, as it is in the Bible. What's liberty? Brothers, it's Christ. We've been liberated from the laws of sin and death. We no longer have to go through the Levitical laws in order to be saved. We went through Jesus Christ. And because we went through Jesus Christ, guess what? We are bought with a price. We are not our own. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We belong to Christ. He tells us how to live, and we're supposed to live every day for Jesus Christ as we look for that blessed hope. That's what it means. Remember, we did the study on looking at uh, the helmet for hope of salvation. Looking for that blessed hope. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, be very careful. Reading this, it was just amazing talking with the Lord about this stuff. Don't get puffed up. Don't get prideful. It was just to start it out with, you know, people writing him letters, commending him, and giving Paul all the credit, and trying to puff Paul up, and Paul's like, no. God gets the glory. God gets the credit. I didn't save you. God did. Okay, this is God's words I'm sharing with you, not mine. God's words. Okay? So don't get puffed up. Don't start falling. For some of you, brothers, says Christ, keep standing for the word of God. Don't fall into the trap of, oh, you got to do this, it's trying to pull you back under laws, whether they're the laws of God or the laws of man in order to be saved. Don't fall for that. Okay? And number one, don't be part of this movement because Satan is just infiltrating everything and all that's left for him to infiltrate and he's doing it is the bio, truly Bible believing God fearing men and women the, the church of the living God he's trying to infiltrate it and one of the things he brings in is he tries to mess up what true liberty is in the Bible and gets you to put sin under liberty and say well we have liberty now I can do it all I want no you can't you gave up that old man we're supposed to be dead to sin okay so I just wanted to do a quick reading this morning. I got some Bible studies the Lord's working on me with, and we'll get out some more Bible studies. Uh, Brothers and Christ, I don't know how long we're going to be here. 
I really don't. I cannot say he's definitely coming today. He could. That's what the Bible says we're supposed to have. Our attitude is, is if God could come back today, and he can, I need to live for Jesus and make sure to get work done for the Lord and live for the Lord every day. Could he come back tomorrow? Yes. Could he come back this year? Yes. You know, could we still be here for a while? Possibly. But I live every day. Every day as if Jesus could come back. But I see a lot of wickedness going on in the world. It's getting to the point, I remember talking to you, Brother Sister Christ, I think it was four years ago in one of our walk and talks, that I really don't like going to town. And this was before the pandemic. Um, pandemic. Um, I really didn't like going into town because the wickedness. I'd go in there to, lay, to hand out gospel tracts every once in a while, lay gospel tracts places. I mainly go into town to get food and whatever's necessary for me to live here. And sometimes I'll walk on the beach and find good beaches that are secluded that not many people are on it. Not because I don't hate the world. It's just the, the world is just so evil and wicked. And the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. It's even worse today. The whole point I'm getting to, it's even worse today. I had brothers out there that desperately need prayer that have to work in this filth out there. They have jobs. They really have to deal with the wicked world. There's some of us that are blessed that we live out in the boonies and we only have to go in there and deal with the lost world when God wants us to deal with the lost world. But you have some brethren that have to deal with the lost world on a day-to-day -day basis. And they desperately need our prayer, brother and sister Christ. They desperately need our prayer. Um, so please be praying for them. Thank you for going with me through these scriptures. I know we just read them and talked about them. Uh, brother and sister Christ, stay in the Word. Don't change the words of God. Trust the word. God chose certain words in, in the, or in passages in the scriptures for a reason. Do you believe this is God's perfect written word? Then don't change God's word. Don't add to, don't subtract from. Don't. Okay. So stick with the word. Stick with prayer. And continue to look for that blessed hope, brothers and sisters in Christ. God opened the scriptures to us and let us know we're no longer under the law of sin and death. We're no longer under the Levitical laws. We're under Jesus Christ. He commands, we obey. So grace and peace. Grace and peace. I want you to have grace, God's grace, and protection. I'm praying for the protection of the brethren during these times. And I want you to have peace during these times. Not my peace, God's peace. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, thank you for watching.